Hello, everyone. How's it going? Welcome to the Righteous Gaming Podcast. I am Tyler, your host, and with me I have Pierre. Hey, everyone. And Dylan, aka TCG Talk on What's the up? socials. So this is our first podcast that we are recording. Um, hope you guys like it. Our goal for the podcast is to be a source of news, information, as well as in-depth analysis based on what's going on in the flesh and blood world in regards to tournament preparation, tournament results, and different decks that are making a name for themselves. So without further ado, uh, let's get into our first thing. We have a big season ahead of us right now as far as spoilers go. Um, and so I know I've been pretty excited to see the different heroes that have been announced um, and to start to see some of their cards and try to start to build and play them. Um, what are your guys' thoughts so far on the Misfail spoilers? What's the most exciting thing that you've seen so far? Man, it's Enigma for sure. <laughs> Enigma? I think, uh, yeah, so we're recording this at the time uh, before Warsaw, uh, mm. so most of the commons and rares have been spoiled. Just out of those, um, I think just Enigma, just I've played her a lot since those spoilers. Uh, she just feels very tricky, very high skill to play, and like that's I like those kinds of decks um, where it's not super linear. Um, I think new also is cool, uh, but I, I don't think we've seen enough yet to like truly get me excited. But I definitely see potential there. Zen is like. I think the spoilers don't aren't showing enough yet to be excited. For sure. Yeah, yeah, I know with Enigma, our team had has been playing her a little bit, and I got a message from someone last night, and he messaged me and said, "Man, I just got destroyed by someone on your team on Talishar, or yeah, on Talishar using those righteous gaming sleeves, and man, Enigma is crazy." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, maybe we should." Hold, hold back on the Talos are playing public opponents for a while. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Dylan, like, the deck's not going to change so much. I was about to say, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if that was me, Pierre, because I, I beat the brakes off of Bravo last night. I don't know who it was. Um, no, Enigma is really fun. She, like, obviously, everyone, like, the whole point of Spoiler Season is to say, like, really definitive stuff. Like, what are you doing during Spoiler Season if you don't? You know, that's, like, half the fun of it. Um but she does have certain, it already seems like on face, she has certain matchups where it's like you just deterministically win once you get to a certain point. Like I know Pierre destroyed me on new when I was playing new because like he put down at instant speed of shimmers on my turn because the aura that lets you play it at instant speed popped. And then, yeah. And then I get to a point where as new, like, yes, it's assassin. So action point economy isn't there, but I get to a point where do I end my turn when he already has ward six on the board to kill that shimmers or do I try to push through? Because if I give him a turn with ward six, then he just makes five more. And then all of a sudden you're at ward 10 and like with certain decks, unless you're a ninja, right. Or even KO, like you're not breaking through that. So like, yes, that was kind of a unique case, but yeah, she seems really fun. But even me playing her, like it, it's just, there's so many decision points. And I've heard a couple people say it where she just seems like, peak flesh and blood not to the point of like prism or anything like that but it's even more so like there's so many like cool nuances of like when ward which ward pops when how does it pop i've learned some stuff even like doing stuff in the resolution step versus like the damage step right like if someone has to debilitate and you have something in arsenal you let it hit and then when the debilitate goes in the stack then you play little stuff like that that like in paper you don't get that especially if you're like a newer to mediocre player medium level player even uh, so she scratches that part of your brain where she like forces you to play the game better, if that makes sense. So it's been really cool seeing that. Yeah. So one of the biggest things I think, uh, well, two things. Uh, as a, I'm an ex Icelander player. I used to play Icelander a lot. Um, like Enigma does tickle that part of your brain uh, the exact same way Icelander did. Um, like you have you have to play on both both the turns, which is which is huge. Uh, and I enjoy getting back that piece of flesh and blood I was missing. The the other thing is, I think it's Taylor Crawford that made a twi uh, Twitter post about it, and he said that Enigma is more Prism than Prism it currently is, and I think that actually means a lot. And I I very much agree. Um, it's 
you know, now Prism, Prism V2, uh, is very combo focused. Um, it's not at all like the essence of old Prism or, or V1 for Monarch, where like it's death by t a thousand cuts, at least like the Aura later versions were. And I think Enigma kind of also takes that part of Illusionist back. So I think it's like a perfect mix of, you know, you have to intently play on your <coughs> opponent's turn a lot and, and be smart about both sides of the of the game but um you also get to have that like feeling from from back in the day prism v1 yeah pierre we've already seen her weapon um which weapon you're using for enigma right now uh i mean i, I call cosmos i think cosmos is so strong I, I mean there's like talks of iris i've seen and and like refractor but it's like I mean, right now with what we know, only commons and rares and and like uh, her one like spec instant. Um, I think Cosmo is just better. Uh, we'll see what the Majestics bring, but I assume they'll push even you more towards the uh, the Cosmos way. Yeah, that yeah. that's been the... wanna... okay. I was saying, I I know you've been playing more new and assassin um, yeah. recently, so I wanted to hear what you think about. New. new new is really interesting because in my it's like i'm oversimplifying it a little bit but she's literally a mix of usiri and arachne she plays like arachne from a cost curve in like a like a sequencing perspective i guess is the best way to put it but she has the more just dis in my opinion the more like kind of disruption and variability that usiri had so she can run both like i've seen as, as this is all early builds, right, and all just, like, fun testing. But I've seen some people, sure. like, taking it super heavy fatigue because she can run stuff like red unmovable super easy because she has, like, 27 blues mm -hmm. um, and run, like, other defense reactions. And then they just play, like, the late game with life gain. Uh, and then some people like me, I'm playing, like, the more, like, aggressive just attack reaction-based build where, like, I can legitimately race you unless you're, like, a KO uh, because I'm dealing 10-plus damage a turn with on hits. So she's going to have, I think, some cool things – um, I'm waiting on her Majestics. I'm assuming, and this is, again, every time I say something, I have to preface this. I don't know stuff. <laughs> but I think they're going to have to give her something that makes people interact with her, right? Because there are going to, like, like almost like a Pulse Wave Harpoon, but for freaking Assassin, because there is that inevitability of, like, if people just don't interact with you. And, like, you don't want to give her every tool in the world, but we saw it with Gorgon's Gaze. Like, that almost, like, it doesn't make people interact with you, but it does, like help a little bit with that aspect so if she can get more stuff like that i think she'll be really good um but her cards are awesome because they they buff uziri like every like all these areas that played infect backstab and uh uh wither as as of late right you can just replace all those with the new assassin cards and yes they don't have the freaking banish on block thing but they do have the life gain and banish a card from the top card of your deck so now literally every card uziri throws has an on hit uh, which is pretty good. And then, again, side note, Arachne Solitary Confinement, the Blitz version, got the ultimate upgrade in the world because all of those have go again now. So that card, I can't wait for Skirmish yeah. Season to play that hero. That's a totally off-topic, like, long target thing, but <laughs> it's going to be really funny to play that hero, and, like, he has three zero for three go again on hit, banish, gain a life. Like, that's pretty good. So, Yeah, that's yeah. real good. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing some early reports of, Pardon the pun, but new being toxic. Is yeah. That, that accurate? Yeah. Well, that the people just don't like playing decks that mess with them, right? It's the assassin problem. For it's sure. the same thing. But yeah, I she'll... mean, I, yeah. I play ninja. I get it. Yeah. No, I mean, for sure. I, I hate being messed with. But yeah, that's the thing. Speaking and, of ninja. Yeah, ninja. Yeah, that's what I'm waiting on. I just want to see what Zen has because right now he's just really bad, like to be frank. But it also, I think. I mean, you think back to other Katsu, right? Like, think of Katsu without his big M's, like Dishonor and McGinchy and, like, Laura Wind and all, like, all of his, like, really key pieces other than Bonds have been the big ticket, like, Majestics, even Fine Center, Pre Arata. So, sure. I think you really need to wait and see what Zen has before we verdict on him more than any I other mean, of them. For what it's worth, I think, uh, like people will say anything is toxic in like a vacuum like they just don't like what they don't like yeah uh, to play against and like you know people can say new is toxic but people can also say enigma is toxic <laughs> or zen is toxic regard like i don't know we don't know what these years are gonna be right like it's yeah. so early and like uh, people would just call whatever toxic it's it's 
you know, it's Twitter. Usually I just say whatever Pierre plays is toxic. It, and that's the that's the thing. As at first, that was like a negative thing of spoiler season, but now it's like it's just a part of it. Like everyone wants to say something's broken, everyone wants to say something's toxic. Like that's the fun part of spoiler season to me, more so than the negative side of it. It's just people like freaking it's out. Fun during spoiler season. Yeah. And then it gets really annoying during comp seasons where like <laughs> yeah. every week there's a new hero that's busted and some new interaction that's busted. It's like people don't have enough sure. trust in the devs, I think, and like you know, they say, oh, ALS loop is broken and stuff. It's like, okay, like, there's ways you can beat that. Like, I mean, it's... People are just going to maul at everything. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, I'm historically a, din a ninja player. And so, I mean, New and Enigma are the two new exciting heroes that everyone's talking about. But, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see where Zen goes because... I'm hearing rumors of him being more defensive. I mean, Zen, Zen State, you can make that yeah. connection. Um, and the previous, the most recent ninja cards we've gotten were in the Iro Blitz deck out of Round the Table, and you had some defensive block cards and made Crouching Tigers. Um, and so I think that we haven't fully seen Zen. That's kind of what they, how they want us to feel because um, it, it's kind of hard to make multiple ninjas and not make them kind yeah. of repetitive mm -hmm. yeah. um, i mean Fi had his thing with the phoenix flame he was pretty aggro katsu is supposed to be a little more mid-range um and lately he's been a lot more aggro so it'll be interesting to see which direction they take zen i mean if he is more defensive i'm gonna be super excited to play him because that takes us back to the old flick flack days back in the crew meta where you didn't have a whole lot of attacks um combo lines you just kind of Played nine flick flacks and value blues and I'd outvalue your opponent. And so, um, as a Katsu main, I'm not excited to play an Enigma because I have to have my stuff hit to get all my triggers and get my big turns, right? If you have Ward 10 out there, I'm not hitting for a long time. And that's going to be real annoying. But if Zen can be more of a defensive mid range deck that can beat Enigma, then it, um, he may be able to pro propel himself to the top of the meta um, as well. So um, that's something I'm wanting to see still. I think this weekend we'll get a pretty good idea of how he how he plays, and um, we'll see we'll see how it goes. Well, one of the biggest things that, like, you know, uh, pushes those thoughts is uh, the hero pages uh, mm -hmm. on the FabTCG website. Um, I think Zen basically says he's a defensive ninja. Uh, Enig Enigma is a little bit more perplexing like there's thoughts that maybe she has a demi demi hero or like a like, demi hero light like card yeah yeah because mm. like she has to transform or something I, I don't quite remember the exact words but that's that's how i interpreted it uh i didn't check news but like those hero pages give kind of a good amount of insight into what we're expecting to come from warsaw on mm -hmm. this weekend i think warsaw like the calling itself is gonna spoil five and then there's like a bunch of content creators that are spoiling this uh this weekend as well so i think like by monday uh, we should have mo or you know by tuesday we should have most cards by tuesday i've already gotten 50 games in with zen so <laughs> we'll see how it goes yeah, weekend's grind time any yeah. any last predictions for either of the three heroes um before we move on not predictions, but I did want to point out one thing with the Chi that I think is really interesting is like I had it happen to me today sure. where it there was just this deterministic loop with Enigma that was very annoying where I was on new, they were on Enigma. We both had like four cards left and they were all Chi and they didn't have anything in their banish I could play. But on my turn, when I tried to attack with like my four cards left, pretty much, they just activated Enigma, made a spectral shield and then let it pop and like defend it basically they like looped their chi to where they were just kept making spectral shields every single turn with plus one and then like it was just really crazy so it's gonna be really funny to see like we've been about all about math and all about like you know just sheer numbers and i think these heroes have the potential to start to bring back the asymmetric style gameplay where it's like you're messing with your opponent or you're playing towards a certain thing more so than okay i had a 15 value turn cycle i'm winning now like right because this has been the most healthy meta we've had but i'm excited to see this kind of bring i guess variance is the buzzword that people bring in right or variants are more asymmetric style play so i think these years have the potential to do that which is gonna be fun yeah i I, sure. I i agree like 
Enigma especially is I think brings a lot of asymmetric gameplay to the to the meta. Uh, one thing to note is you know um, we had Jomai leaving recently, uh, and people are you know they're learning how to play against Enigma st- or still, but it's it's something to note that with Jomai you kind of could ignore the dragons or you can choose which dragons to kill etc so the onus of like clearing board was on the opponent um with enigma like the onus of clearing board is like on enigma uh, like, it depends on how she defends uh what uh aura she picks to uh, to 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 die like there's the onus is on her and so I think it's gonna bring a lot of asymm- asymmetrical gameplay, where like the opponent is gonna try to clear your board, but at the same time maybe leak. Like there's gonna be you know evas- ev- evasive damage. Uh, I think is gonna be huge for um, to clear into Enigma stuff like dominate, attack reacts, all these things. I think Enigma you know is gonna be. I, I honestly don't quite know where she's going to end up, but I, I'm pretty excited. Uh, she already feels quite powerful without her M's, so so we'll see. Yeah, I agree. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the limited format of this set brings because this is the first time that they're um, capping us at 30 cards for the deck. Like, your limited deck has to have 30 cards. Yeah. Can't go over, you can't go under. And so the whole chi generation, getting some cards back in your deck and then using your hero ability towards the end of the game like Dylan was talking about, those end-of-game loops is going to be pretty key on who can use their cards the best or limited. So um, knowing those end-game strategies for each hero is definitely going to make a difference in your gameplay. Um, mm-hmm. One of the uh, biggest so things another... to note, though, with, G- with like limited is uh, capping at 30 makes new new kind of like the fatigue here like i think that pushes like the three strategies very well like new is going to tr- try to fatigue because you're kept at 30 you can't fat stack into new and new can't fast stack into you uh zen might want to be aggro uh a lot you know he has to use his, his cards very efficiently i think if you're capped at 30 pure mid range is going to be worse and then enigma i think is just going to do enigma stuff and is like at 30 40 doesn't matter uh yeah, I would say though for everyone, like play play with the precons. Yeah. Uh, there are forty cards, yes, but it's very good to like kind of get the hang of like what the designers wanted you to play with those heroes. I mean, at least you know, like in in like limited, it kind of mirrors that. So. Yeah. What do you think yeah. of those precons? Uh, I think I mean they're decent. Like they're obviously made to be somewhat like equal power levels so like obviously like the enigma one has some card choices that i I don't agree with but obviously it's pre-cons right like you never agree with a pre-con as a comp player but uh yeah they're fun they're fun to play i played all three i have 10-ish games on three it's it's uh it's fun what do you think of those pre-cons they're really good i think they had a hard follow-up with heavy hitters because i think heavy hitters is the best pre-cons they've made not only from like a gameplay perspective but just from a feel like you got the full art agile windups and stuff and stuff like that and the bone breaker bellows and stuff so um i'm glad that they kind of stuck with that same thing i know some people were like on the fence of like having to buy all three as one, but I think that makes more sense because I've seen single pre-cons just sit on shelves for freaking ever. Um, it doesn't bode well. It's it's because most time, nine times out of 10 when someone's buying a pre-con, it's a new player, right? So it feels good to just say, hey, buy all three heroes, have fun, play with your friends, play at the kitchen table. So I'm excited about them. They all felt really good. The videos the LSS did, like I encourage people to go watch those too. It gives you a feel for how the heroes play. They did a really good job with those. Zen feels a little bad because sometimes there's no way to buff your tiger. So you keep making all these tigers, you can't use it. Um, not all the time. It'll be interesting to see what weapon he uses. But yeah, overall, they're good. They're, the last two sets, precons have drastically improved. Like since Outsiders, really, but the last two sets specifically. Yeah, I think also for the sure. precons in the in Mizfell are like there's full art auras i think i saw at least in like the dev videos maybe mm-hmm. I'm, yeah they, I'm brought, they sure. brought those back and you get rainbow four here yeah yeah i might, I might yeah. have to uh to buy a a bunch of the of them 
Yeah. I need my yeah, color I, chorus. I, <laughs> I really enjoy the the way they did the blitz decks this time. Even if you have the whole bundle, I mean, this is the first time you're getting booster packs in an ancillary product that is in the booster box, right? Like, you can buy your three blitz decks. You get your booster packs. You get a play mat. You get a cool card carrying box. Like, it really has everything. So I think that's really cool. And if anyone's not sure about getting the whole set i'm sure some lgs's will open it and sell the deck separately and throw packs in a dispenser and still get the same value out of it that way so i think it was really cool and i was really excited to see the end product that they did on that does it have one mat or two mats it's one. Oh, okay one okay. usually it's one yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool it's pretty cool mm-hmm. yeah um moving on now so uh we just got done with pro quest season um, our team won, what, six to eight events, something like that. We won on six different heroes, including Teclo. Um, and so the last week of ProQuest season, we saw a huge shift uh, in the meta, meta because of the release of the KO Armory deck and a couple of key cards. And so um, do you guys think that, that that KO's momentum is going to carry on through Mistvale? Or do you think that the impact of Sash um, is going to is going to keep him on top for national season, or do you think this field is going to start to counter KO a little bit? Uh, uh, so my perspective on KO is that like data was like last week of PQ, I went like the weekend Sash and Run Roughshod came out, so that means not every KO most likely had those cards. Um, he was about 25% of ProQuest wins. Um, I I did top uh, PQ with uh, with KO uh, on the last weekend. Uh, sorry, the weekend, the third weekend. Uh, once I won with Prism, and uh, it was my very first. No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, once I won with a different hero, I got brought for, a different for, hero for, for context. Exactly, for context, I had already won my PQ, so I wanted to play a different hero. It was my first ever CC reps on KO, like in paper, and like I just oopsed into a t- in finals of a pro quest. Like it's 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 absurd. Like that deck is like really good if you're like semi decent at the game, and Sash actually helps a good bit into a lot of KO's like kind of iffy matchups like two-headed warrior I mean obviously I'm uh, uh, I'm a Kasai player and Kasai into KO feels so good like uh, KO has a really awful time in or at least pre-Sash before Sash and now that Sash is here um, I think he actually shifts the matchup towards KO. Like as as warrior, you always feel like if KO just had one more turn of like st- very strong turn, um, you lose the game. And like obviously it's flesh and blood, so every game is kind of tight uh, most of the time. But you you just feel like if you had one more blood rush or one more something, one more power uh, turn, uh, you lost the game. And the Sash provides that. Um, I mean, Sash is just blood rush value on board. Um, like it allows you to play one more attack uh, of, of for six value about, um, and he blocks two. Um, like it's eight value on board, and it's it's I don't know that that card's pretty strong. Obviously, like all your like Ko admittedly is the best one of the best tunic decks. Like I mean, you really want your tunic uh, your tunic counter for like your four cost uh, cycles. But now I think with Sash, you go towards more aggro where you want to go two go again or two cost go again, claw two cost. And it's like your bread and butter. And you don't really miss Tunic with those with those turns. And so it, it feels it feels like it, Kyo definitely got pushed. And I, I expect him to, to, to get to get LL pretty soon. How soon? How soon do you think LL is going to happen, Dylan? Uh, yeah, we we talked about this a little bit. I'd be very surprised if he makes it to the Pro Tour. Um, be very very surprised. I don't. I we'll see what happens on this weekend, right? With the Majestics and how things work. I can tell you right now, on face, I don't see any of the Misfield heroes stopping him. He's just going to pop everything Enigma tries to do. 
Um, like he's just going to push through her stuff. She doesn't have enough forward to slow that down, in my opinion. Uh, maybe she could try to fatigue him, but that's just my opinion initially. Zen is a 50-50. Agar is always 50-50, so whatever, like on that. But then you have to say, is Ko better into the field than a Zen or a Katsu is? And currently right now he is. Uh, and then new Assassin is also kind of 50-50, but like, for example, I was playing Arachne at the Bowharden. I played two KOs. The first game, his worst turn was 13 damage, and I lost in like six turns. Nothing I could do. I literally played as perfect as I could. The second game, he didn't see a Blood Rush for the first like four turns, and I banished one, and then I beat the brakes off of him because he I triple did an Eradicate. So sometimes Assassin can like really punish them but typically it's not the case yeah i don't i don't see him making it to the pro tour sash is ridiculous i even had one ko do like he rolled scabs which was nuts with blood rush in hand he rolled a six as is tradition but then he activated sash and then played savage feast for free drew uh claude played the new blue for free and then something else so it was like a 30 plus damage turn off blood rush um with sash because he could just play the one cost for free essentially so super super good um i just don't see a deck that's going to slow him down i'm not saying he's gonna be like starvo level just like taking names every single event but i like it i it's no disrespect to national season it's just a lot of the events are really small right so like they're the same size as like a pro quest so it's not like he's having to like go through the gauntlet of nationals with like 20 hundred plus person events it's not like that like there's only like five to ten countries that get above 96 players so basically he's playing a bunch of pro quest level events when it comes to like size so i don't see him making it i'd say like just past nationals i think but there's he more ll points too yeah to given, huh? yeah exactly and there's 20 and there's 20 points per small event and 40 per anything that's above a 96 cap and then us is 100 so like that's a ton of points so i don't see him making it to the answer there just that kind know. of feels bad. Yeah. Like putting out an armory deck and then two months later it LLs and now you yeah. can't play it as an armory deck anymore. Yeah. Like maybe you can, your store can create a rule. Like if you're playing the KO armory deck, you can bring it to your armory events, right? Like it, that's what it's designed Or to have more social play or something like that. And that's why I always tell new players don't pick sure. a hero, pick a class. Don't pick a hero. Never pick a hero when you come in the game. Pick a class you like and then buy those cards. Because if you like Brute, then you can play Reinar with Savage Sash or whatever. Right? It feels a little bit better. Yeah. Try not to get involved with one hero. Because I think that time in Flesh and Blood's kind of gone with how fast heroes are though. I, th I don't yeah. think it's an issue with uh, with like how fast heroes are low. I think mm -hmm. LO system is like actually quite good uh, to, to like rotate strong heroes. I think it's too you know two things the first one being you know relative power level like if you're top deck like it might you know two years ago you might have been like mid or like you know a tier not the best but decent and now it's just like one step above everything and so obviously it's gonna get every LL point um so it's relative power level between the first deck and like every if everything else and then the fact that the game is uh downpowering uh you know as the game downpowers like fab 2.0 uh you are going to get like those pushed heroes um that are just better than everything else and like i think ko like i agree with you dylan i don't know how much game enigma is gonna have like we we have how many Majestics each? Like five or six for the new heroes? Yeah, especially four for else. each class that hasn't been given out yet. Yeah, yeah for sure. So so there's still some things, right? Like maybe Zen can compete. Like I, I actually could see that. Uh, but the... the like facts the heck of a card. Yeah, but I think KO, like in a vacuum right now, just like not knowing what's coming this weekend uh, is, is still best deck. Um, we... I don't necessarily think it's only Sash. Like I actually think nah. Run Rough Shot is like the best card that came out of that deck, uh, of that armory deck. Um, it's one of the best cards Sash, in this whole deck. Man. Sash has Blood Rush value on it, but Run Rough Shot allows you to have like just three card hands that are just really good, and that that fits with like not playing Tunic, right? Because like one, now you have a one cost, 
instead of a two cost to finish your turn so you don't need four resources like it fits a little better um and, and just like a one cost i mean even if you're playing tunic like the one cost just a lot like fits in your your resource curve really well uh run roughshod is just i think incredible uh and i think that is the card that is pushing ko actually. yeah it gives them two uh, card 11s basically while yeah, riding the rough like shot good sash is good but i think uh run rough shot is like increasing this consistency to where like he's just a, a nudge above everyone else whereas you know before the armory deck he was just uh a slightly better maybe just not even the best deck hey it was hey it was entering Lexi territory when it's the de best deck and you're gonna start having to play KO or something that beats KO honestly so um but something you said Pierre about LL I mean you said that heroes are starting to LL like I don't I don't think they're LLing fast enough Interesting. we've gotten I disagree what, five six seven as of this set we got eight new heroes this year and we've only had one LL this year. Like, that's seven additional heroes to the meta. We have over 20 heroes now. So um, I'd like to start seeing heroes LL faster so that we can maintain a steady and consistent number of heroes in the meta. Um, like If we get to a place where we have 30, 40, even 50 different heroes because we keep getting added, like, what, 14, 15 a year and only, like, three or four a year go away, like, that's so much for... A player a new player to learn how to beat 30 different heroes you know like um, and then you'll have heroes that just aren't good and you can't make all the heroes good um i think i'd like to see as many starting this year as many heroes that get introduced this season i would like to see ll in a year you know um so we can keep the number around 20 25 heroes total to play um i think battle hardens being 40 points is huge and that was, I think they rolled that out during Lexi season. Um, so we haven't been, you know, long enough in that cycle of LL where, like, we really see the impact. I think, like, uh, maybe we look back on after 2024 and see how much that actually helped push heroes uh, towards LL. But I think right now, like, there's nothing really to complain about. Like, there's, to me, there's clear tiers of, like, power. And yes, there's a lot of heroes, but for a new player, I think that's a good thing. Like having, a, you know, a bunch of different things to play into, new things. But also as a comp player, like it, it tests your sideboarding. One of the, you know, you're choosing the right deck that has de de decent odds into most things. Or you really want to target like the top of the meta and forego some of the bottom. Like there's a bunch of like deck building and deck choice strategies that you can use so i, I don't hate it um we'll, we'll just see how the yellow uh like battle hard at 40 points and pti events at 10 points is, is gonna change things yeah and if, you, and if you think about like how me heroes are close like bravo has 127 points during the heavy hitter season quotes right and then dash has 112 and then we have three heroes above 700 like five is at 783 da uh, dash at 810 and bravo is at 711 so you have like three heroes that pretty much are going to ll back to back to back um and also you have to think about like you want them to ll fast there's two things one i don't think a hero should ever ll before it gets to the worlds in the year it was released which potentially KO could do. Like they, if wherever you release the hero, it should it should make it to worlds. That's in my opinion. I don't think sure, it should sure. go away for full worlds. And the second thing is like you gotta think about classes since they switch classes every set. Like right now, let's just say hypothetical world that the no this wasn't a ninja set and you had Fi and Katsu both at like eight ten. There's a world where like you can't play cards in your class, and that feels that would feel horrible. So I think they have to make it wide enough to where they can refuel every class with a new hero, because you might get in that weird situation where like you literally can't play any of the cards you have, and that would feel really bad. So they have to. I think they have to make that's in my opinion the sweet spot is making it to where it lasts till the next time the class is refueled is the best way to put it. Sure, I agree with that, and I agree that I would like a hero to last at least a year, a calendar mm -hmm. year before the LL. Um, I'm just, and I I see that there's like three or four getting close. It's just I'm seeing that the number of CC heroes is gradually increasing. We're up to 27 CC heroes 
um, with another, I think, six to be released this year after after Missville, not including Missville. Um, and so, like, that's going to go up to 33 oh. minus three for Heroes at Will LL, maybe four. Then you're at 29, 30 Heroes. Like, to me, that number is getting a little high, especially if you're getting into the game for the first time. You see there's, like, 30 different options. Tons of Heroes you have to know how to play against with your deck. Um, but... Yeah, I just want to make sure that... I don't want the ones that just got released to LL. I want the hero to be in the format for two to three years and then see its way out. So Mm -hmm. it also makes developing heroes easier for LSS when they know the speed of heroes coming in and out. That's not an issue with, like, the LL... Like, the LL process. Uh, That's an issue with... uh either having you know you can't say i want every hero uh to stay at least a year when like you have a starvo situation for example right like sure. you can't put time restrictions on ll uh but you can't you can't also say okay like you know i want all these heroes to ll around the same time like ideally ideally if everything was completely equal and like lot of big numbers like you would get if all heroes at the same power level you would get like every hero from a season with l at the same time stuff like that right and so it's i don't know if it's a problem with the ll system or rather like i think it's like a, a incremental purge from lss uh, lss perspective where like they're trying to purge out the early heroes and just like add a bunch of new heroes at the same time. The issue is that that does dilute the number of LL points attributed to each. And so there's a world where like everything wins at the same rate. And then everything just like within, I don't know, a few months, everything just LLs. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that's likely at all. But like there is a world where that happens, uh, which is which is interesting. Sure. I'm just saying like 14 new heroes in a year and only five LL. If we do that for five more years, we have so many heroes in the meta. So yeah, well, it's no, also it, it, last I'll say it's also a product of a healthy meta. Like for example, I'm looking right now, eleven out of twenty-seven of the heroes, um, or twenty-four at the time, ha- got over a hundred points since heavy hitters release. So like over half of the field has dispersed, even with chaos dominance have, have dominance air quotes have gotten that much. So like the healthier the game is, the slower heroes are going to LL. So it's really hard because, like, if you want heroes to LL fast, you're going to have to have an unhealthy meta, which isn't a hit on what you were saying, Tyler. It's just, like, that's probably the dichotomy they're facing, right? They want people... They want heroes to rotate out decently fast so they can get fresh meta games, but they also want a healthy meta. And, like, that's... If you have a healthy meta, heroes aren't going to LL fast because everybody's taking, like, their lion... The equal lion share of the... um, Right, exactly. LL points, so that's hard. But, yeah. For sure. Um, it's it's interesting because we had two competitive seasons in the past three months to get them all those points and we'd have like nationals and that's mm-hmm. it until September when there's finally another pro quest season well, there's in, a four, pro in tour. four months there's a pro yeah tour. but like but there's not seasons like one hero gets points for during sure, pro tour. Sure. it's not going to be you know 12 different heroes getting 100 points and so mm. by the time we hit the next set in September we're gonna have what ko gone and that's it um and so and there's not gonna be any events like there's battle horns and callings but i don't know it's just it's just my thoughts and i would i know that they're thinking about it and lss isn't going to create a world where it's bad for new players or where it's a stale meta like they're not going to do that they're they've been very good at balancing things um i just am curious how they're going to do that Mm-hmm. It's so, a difficult um, thing to balance. It's like a, a difficult sure. problem for LSS, but I mean, I trust LSS in, in like finding the best way that they think would it is is best for the game. So, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not too worried about that yet at all. Yeah, I'm not either. All right, final thing we want to get to is we want to talk about some upcoming events that are happening in the flesh and blood world. Um, the first event is uh, this weekend. We got the Calling Warsaw very dedicated group of players in Poland. Um, I've met a lot of them myself. They're fantastic group of players. Um, and Europe gets a big event. 
um, as well. European players are very good. They're usually the majority share of Pro Tours or Worlds. And so um, is this like, is KO just going to take it? Is it just going to be 30, 40% KO meta? And we can all see how good this card really is. Or um, do, you, do we got a surprise coming? It's KO. <laughs> KO. It's for sure. Like, there's no new cards, right? Like, <clears throat> you, you take the ProQuest last week of ProQuest when the deck, uh, the armory deck released. I don't know exact numbers, right? But let's assume only 50% of those KOs had the Sash and, and run Roughshod. Like, obviously, it's like limited access to the armory deck. I mean, by Warsaw, I assume every KO that's presenting their deck at Warsaw is just going to have those pieces. And so, I, I mean, I'm expecting like 30% representation of, of KOs. Uh, I mean, and, and, and I, I do think he was going to win. Like, I, I, I don't see otherwise. And we saw this in Richmond, right? Richmond happened the exact same weekend uh, as... as uh, uh, as ProQuest season or last week of ProQuest and like KO won. Uh, KO had three people in the top eight and like it was a relatively small ri uh, Richmond Battle Hard was at less than 100 players. Like that's still significant. That's 40 LL points. And then you have, you 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 know, 25% of wins from last week. And then you're going to Warsaw literally just a week after. Like I just don't see... I just don't see how uh, Kyo's not winning, uh, to be honest. Yeah, it uh, it will. So Richmond was really weird. So yeah, Kyo won it, and I do think the short answer is Kyo's the favorite. But what happened in Richmond, just because I was there, is one there was zero prism, not zero zero, but like out of the ninety six people, I walked on the tables after a round because I played there. I saw maybe five prism. There might have been a couple more, a couple less, but there was definitely less than ten. Uh, I'd be very surprised if Prism was even 5% of that meta, and which doesn't affect KO too much, but it does affect all the other decks, right? And one thing that I saw a lot of people doing, a lot of Guardian players, is they were saying, F the Prism matchup, I'm going to run Hyper Fatigue Guardian, and I'm going to tell KO you're not beating me. And they literally came with, like, the like the Betsy list, but for Bravo and Victor. Like, it was, like, staunch response, unmovables, you know, peace of mind, sigil, blessing and deliverance like been there before. yeah like it was Classic. like you are not gonna kill me and so that's funny that's how we started off the season yeah at way way back in hartford that people were running that kind of crap well what was funny about it was top eight with that crap there yep. it's just a weird it's a weird ko is creating a weird shift in like how other decks can perform because what happens is let's say you have a lot of guardian well then kano becomes absolutely insane because kano literally can beat that deck with its eyes closed um it's not even like fun and then if you have a good azalea that sides in dreadbore uh they absolutely destroy that deck too like dreadbore new horizon in the side which most azaleas are running right now and then you have then you have riptide who absolutely just laughs at that deck um so it's just like there's a couple of heroes that maybe normally would be like right in the middle of tier two that are now bumped up to 1.5 depending on how people are trying to play into ko um so because you could see like if ko is like the understood best deck over the next two events like you could say like okay well what do you do to beat that okay you fatigue it well then all the fatigue decks get destroyed by kano so it's like you i agree i think ko is the best but it can create some really weird top eights where you might have like a riptide two kanos and three ko's you know just like crazy stuff um and riptide is not too bad in the K ko either like it's actually a pretty decent matchup for him so it's it creates KO is the favorite, but I also would not be surprised if you see like a Kano or a Riptide actually like get top eight and have a shot at winning that calling. Not because the deck is like that good, but because how good it is into the decks they're trying to warp to beat KO. It just creates this like weird meta, thing. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, I think uh, like to link to the point you made earlier, Tyler, uh, you said KO is approaching Lexi territories. And I think, like, it's somewhat true. Like, I mean, he's obviously, like, the deck to beat, right? I, don't know. I still but... think Lexi's the most consistent deck in Fab history, but that could be another oh, yeah. conversation for yeah, another no, day. I, I, I don't <laughs> think he's, like, I, I mean, talking about relative power levels, I don't think he's, like, that much no, higher he's... than everything else. Yeah. Like, as much as Lexi was, right? Yeah. But he is the deck to, to target, to beat. 
Um, I think, like, Lexi back then was, you know, a lot of players had bad experiences playing into her. And, like, she she, she was doing, uh, you know, she was playing Disruption and she still had, like, above raid damage. She had Nuts turn with Rain Razor's 3 Oak. Like, Keio doesn't have that. Like, yes, he has Blood Rush. Yes, he has... Uh, Sash, Run Roughshod, like all those power cards, cast Bones, but like you compare their numbers, they're not at all similar. And, and like, just one has Kale, ten, one has ten armor, and the other doesn't. That was, I think, that's yeah, what the equalizer is. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I also think Ko does things that are a lot more targetable. Like you mm -hmm. were talking about Riptide, right? Like Riptide actually has a decent Ko matchup because. Basically, all of Ko's stuff activates his traps, yeah. and now all your traps are like three, four, five value, uh, in counting for the for the ping of damage. And then also like yes, uh, Ko's gonna use has a good fridge, but also like once you're through his fridge as Riptide, like you're kind of balling. Yeah, like, you just you have a good, traps. good bit of effects, right? Yeah. And like Ko kind of has to start playing two card hands, like kind of blocking you, play CNC back, to uh, block you, send some other attack back, like to try to force you not to use your traps non effectively. Uh, but I mean, you know, Ko has to take risks in that matchup with like playing Blood Rush, um, you know. Like your agility is now like kind of iffy. Like, do you actually want agility? Uh, cast bones can also kind of like get nuked. Like, it, I, it's a skill matchup, but I think in like equal skill, Riptide definitely has the leg up. And that's just one matchup. I also yeah. like KO is very targetable, whereas Lexi was less targetable, like by far. Yeah, I think that's overall, yeah, I don't the... think I was comparing yeah. them. Yeah, it's I don't think yeah, I was comparing them to be the same. Our level is just the relative to the meta difference. Like deck to beat, you know, has a leg up on the meta. Like if you don't can't beat KO, you should not bring your deck. I think that I thing. personally, for me, it, so I think it's gonna be a pretty diverse top eight. The last couple of top eight has been really diverse in battle hard and callings, and I think. There's two decks right now in the game that can literally what I call just hit the win button where they draw the right hands and you just lose, which is KO and Azalea. Both of those decks, like, I don't care what your deck is unless you've really had time to set up. They're just going to kill you. Like, you can't block out a 17 dominate Red in the Ledger, right? It's just not going to happen with Dreadbore. So it's just... Uh, they had just have these hands and KO, like if he runs double blood rush and freaking hits you for 30, 30, right. With still 10 armor up, like you're just losing that game. You're not winning. So there's this, there's those two decks that have the high potential to high roll. But I do think that especially Kano, I think Kano is the one that's always going to threaten right now because every deck that wants to combat K KO is playing slow and Kano just laughs at that. And I'm not saying it's favor, but I watched two Kano's play against two prisms. Grant's battle hardened. That matchup was close. I, I think Kano's have figured in Majin Bay and then we're there. So like good Kano's like they've figured out the out to win that matchup, I guess is the best way to put it. And so the matchup's just not free for prism anymore, at least in, from what I was watching. Um, so, and that was in like round seven, like at the top tables. So, you know, I think it's, that's definitely a deck to look out for as well. More so as Kano. I could see. So like in general in TCGs, right? Like you have the best deck, you have the decks, that beat the best decks and then you have the decks that beats the decks deck. that beats the deck the best yeah. deck and sure. i think like because there's no uh there's nothing like dromai that gatekeeps a good portion of the meta like i i i might agree with you that the top eight is gonna look interesting i still think ko is gonna be yeah he'll be two or three slots uh, uh, yeah i think he's gonna be three or four yeah uh, but yeah it's i mean I think he's gonna end up winning, but I, I don't. I don't think it's gonna be like absolute domination from Ko at all. Mm -hmm. And and to your point, like Kano and Prism can feed off like some of the decks that beats the best deck or be or, or you know one uh, level below that. But the the their self regulating decks um, where like you just have to respect them, and now your matchup percentage like dramatically increases um 
obviously some decks just lose to Kano, uh, to Kano uh, aka Kesai. Uh, no bad feelings. Uh, but yeah, I think it's it's gonna be interesting. Like those self-regulating decks are still gonna be around. Um, I still I, it depends on how much people respect them. Like Kano always goes in cycle where like people respect him and he does worse, and then people don't respect him because he does worse, and now he does better. Um, there's basically only Imagine and Peter that are, that are consistent enough with Kano. So we'll see. Um, I, I I still do expect three or four K K Yos in the in the top eight. Yeah. All right, last thing we wanted to talk about was the Japan event in a week. I think it's really cool that Fab is finally going to Japan, they, that they got all that sorted out. Um, and it looks like they have a really cool event lined up. I know we have a couple of players in our team going. They have a really cool prize wall. Um, there's a lot of things that they're doing to help support the players there, some cool promos. Um, so I just wanted to get your guys' overall thoughts about it. Um, also, I want to hear your prediction for what the Japanese exclusive cards are and the Japanese set of Part the Miss Fail. We got a Legendary, we got um, a Marvel. So I want to hear your overall thoughts on Fab going to Japan next week. Yeah, so the Legendary and Marvel are exclusives, right? There's one each. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think the Marvel is going to be, I've said before on different places, The it's going to be the Altar Phantasmal Footsteps. I think those pink feet are the Altar Phantasmal Footsteps. Um, I think that's what it's going to be. I think Legendary is going to be Tunic. I know that's a boring answer, but it would make the most sense, right? They need a printing of Tunic. Like, that's literally the starter card, starter, like, high price card for any deck, and all three of the heroes that are being released could run it. So I would hope that they would do that card. I don't know what other Legendary they would do that's, that's like, Japanese printing. I mean, they can do whatever they want, but that's kind of the biggest one for me as far as predictions. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I hope this is kind of like my selfish hope. I hope that this kind of kicks LSS in a good way to like do other stuff like lore wise, like release a lore book next year, please God, like that stores can buy and sell to people. Like I hope that the, cause the Japanese TCG culture really is big on like storytelling and like culture and thematics just as much as they are gameplay. And I hope that this like kind of motivates LSS in like a positive kind of like, you know, good way. Not that they haven't been doing stuff to like, deep into that. I know in the recent chat cast, James White said that they finally brought on a full-time writer for lore so that they're trying, cause they're trying to get back into doing that. So I hope that this event, the staff can go there and be like, Holy crap. Like let's do like, it just invigorates them to do other ideas. That's kind of what my hope is for this, honestly. Yeah. Um, I think it's hard to predict which cards, the legendaries, yeah. uh, but I, I, I don't the hate footsteps. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't hate footsteps. Uh, I think it's gonna be mask of momentum personally. Like that is currently like that is the most Japanese e uh, sure. like art uh, out of the. You think that for the Marvel heroes? Uh, no, for like you know the Japanese special legendary. Uh, what, yeah, yeah, okay. that, the amount of yeah. money I would pay for that card. Anyway, go ahead. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think that's gonna be the legendary. Uh, maybe tunic. Like me, I agree with. You could see a Marvel tunic, cool. as crazy as that would be, but you could see it. It's not out of the realm of possibility. You have a lot of upset collectors on that one. Cause I mean, I we, the people Marvel have the extended art Marvel. tunic, right? Like collectors have the extended art tunic, so it's like the Japanese extended art version pretty much. It, it probably I think the break the be reprint momentum. policy for gold foil. You don't want I think the Marvel's that. gonna be momentum and then the uh, the legendary will be tunic, like uh Dylan said. Just yeah. this makes much sense. And momentum. Yeah, I, I I don't hate footsteps, but I also think like just in terms of theme, like momentum just is more Japanese to me. Uh I think the event's gonna be cool. It's gonna be the first look into like a competitive look into uh, into how Misval plays in limited. Uh, I mean, I think hmm. it's gonna be. Is it gonna be stream? I assume so, right? Should be, yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I would so, think they would. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, it's gonna be. It's gonna be the first outlook. It's gonna be interesting to see. I'll be in Montreal, like uh, the Battle Harden uh, sealed uh, the weekend after, so it'll be good to. to I'll be in Toronto. I'll be close. Like, That's fine. Oh, Nice, nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
but yeah, I think well, I think it's a great thing. Like using the set to push Japan Japan as the second market, uh, the second biggest market in TCGs. Uh, I mean, I think there's like a tremendous opportunity there. And and like sure. Dylan said, I think like LSS, it does seem, you know, sometimes that L- LSS tries to cater for the US. Obviously, like the number one TCG market. I think like we're going to see similar things for Japan. Um, it's the second and I'm not sure it's by that far. So it's, it's going to yeah. be interesting um, to see how LSS tries to bring in that crowd. Um, and I've been, I've been, I've been hearing some, some, some Japanese TCG players uh, praising fab. So it will be fun to see like from like an entrenched player perspective, like how a new market is like, uh, growing from zero or quote unquote zero. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to, to watch that event and, and hear everything around it. And I think, I think Andy and Pat are, are teammates going right. So hopefully we'll see them do well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I think I'm super excited, excited about the event. I'm in a lot of players who are going, who made time out of their season a couple of weeks before nationals yep. to go to this event, which is really exciting. There's going to be a large international presence there for a calling. So um, that's pretty cool. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how big the event is, how many players they get. And then um, to also see they're doing CC battle hard in there. No, right? I think it's sealed. It's uh, uh, one is draft and the other one's sealed. Yeah, all events that weekend in so. every part of the world are sealed and draft. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to see what their meta was going to look like, but. I mean, CC um, event in the new market is like, eh. I don't know about that. I mean, they I had will, a pro quest season. I will say in, that, like, the Manila the area, team. the Manila, it's not Japan, but, like, Manila in that area, they love their brute. Like, Reinar and Levaya is, like, huge over there and Katsu. Like, so, like, because, like, every time I see, like, a pro quest because they had a they had like the 80 person armory before the game was even supported or whatever um but if you yeah. look at the hero breakdown it's normally like katsu reinar Leviah. not all but like even when reinar wasn't even like a c tier he was like the second most played hero at the event so who knows if that bleeds but i would venture to say heroes that align which all three of these do they did it on purpose align with the japanese culture uh probably will be played initially is my guess Sure. Yeah, I think it's gonna and be interesting. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say it's gonna be interesting because she's a. F- I think she's the only hero to have had five stars and like the difficulty. Complexity. The we were talking about it. W- Which uh, is warranted. Yeah. It's warranted. It's it's a tough <laughs> hero. It's gonna be interesting to see. Like, I'm not saying every Japanese player is new, obviously, but uh, there's gonna be a lot of new players, and I think like Enigma is like her style of play is is attractive for a TCG player. Uh, so I think it's going to be interesting seeing how Enigma grows over there, uh, especially historically Japan has interesting deck building. It kind of goes against the grain sometimes, and it's going to be fun to have that part of the world be unlocked for, for flesh and blood and being more competitive and seeing more ways uh, heroes can be played. And Like I'm expecting a lot of, a lot of cool builds get out of Japan over the next few few years for sure uh my guess is for the legendary and marvel i was on mask momentum for the legendary now i think i'm switched to tunic after seeing that tunic play mat on the prize wall yeah you need a jet you need a japanese tunic it just kind of is what it is yeah uh, my marvel uh different from both of you i'm gonna go marvel oh. ira interesting so i think that Mar- ira has not had a marvel yet and first hero um, Japanese theme on her, so I think that she's gonna get a Marvel version finally, even that though she's true, not playable yeah. in Blitz. But you know, I think that's what we're gonna get. So yeah, I mean, I think Alt-Art. she's not playable in Blitz. That's the first thing. It does make sense though your reasoning of like she is also like the easiest hero to play. Like I mean, it's literally like you have two Kodachis and you or or Edge of Bottom, like whatever. If it's the Recon first deck, uh, and you have like plus one on your second attack every single turn, right? Like it's the most straightforward thing, uh, yeah. and then like 
it, it totally makes sense um, why why it would be the first one or the the Marvel. It was the first of everything for Feb. Uh, but she's banned in Blitz, so I that's why I didn't I didn't go for Ira. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Well, uh, appreciate everyone for watching. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll get back to this. We got, we got a promo code for you guys if you watch this far. Um, Righteous Gaming Podcast. If you send that to me on Discord, you'll get 15% off your TCG low on any cards you want on TCG Player. Nice. Um, we got some... Things planned in the future. We're going to get some different team members on here, have a rotating member slot, and so you won't always see the three of us. Um, but hopefully you'll always see me because I'm the best. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> see. All right. Well, we pre- appreciate everyone for watching. Yeah. Th- yeah. Thanks, everyone. See you all.